We are back. That's right. We are back to the race and ethnic relations podcast show. That's right. We are physically back to the race and ethnic relations podcast show. This is show number 76. This is show number 76. I am your host, Dr. B. Dr. B. Show number 76 is entitled Celebrating Dr. B's Eight Bloomsbury Publishing Books. That's right. Yes, this show is actually celebrating my seven, my eight, my eight, my, what is it? Seven, eight? Seven, seven, seven Bloomsbury books, publishing books. Seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven Bloomsbury books. That's right, seven. I uh, I have published another book, but it wasn't under, <laughs> it was not under Bloomsbury. So my celebrating seven Bloomsbury publishing books. That's right. This is a, a little departure from our major topics, and this is a special moment. This is August eighth, twenty twenty three, and I decided to have this show, show seventy six, celebrating Doctor B's seven Bloomsbury publishing books. With that said. <laughs> I want to thank each and every one of you for turning in and tuning in and listening to uh, Race and Ethnic Relations podcast show. And I want to thank all our platforms. Let me just uh, acknowledge as many of our platforms as possible. Podbean, of course, Podbean. Thank you so much, Podbean, for showcasing our podcast over this, th- what is it, three, four years almost? Three years. Thank you, Podbean. Uh, thank you, uh, Spotify. Thank you, I Heart Radio. Thank you, uh, uh, Audible, Audible. Thank you, Podcast. Thank you, Samsung uh, Podcast. Uh, thank you, uh, Pod Chaser, as well as uh, all the various platforms. I'm, I'm sure I'm missing a few. Uh, and uh, iTunes, iTunes. Thank you, Apple Podcast, Apple Podcast. Thank you for showcasing. All of our uh, platforms. And like I said uh, in the previous um, podcast shows, we're trying to take a different turn in 2023 and 2024. And it's going to be a lot more celebrations, a lot more acknowledgement of individuals, events uh, who have worked hard in race and ethnic relations issues over the not just a year, not just a couple of years, but decades. And who are, uh, like I did a, a couple of shows, acknowledging uh, celebrities, and that's what we're going to do, who have been working hard in improving race and ethnic relations. So this is a show where Dr. B, <laughs> yours truly, is celebrating seven, seven of my Bloomsbury books that are now under Bloomsbury. Uh, they were under a different publisher, but now Bloomsbury has uh, bought the rights from Greenwood Publishing, ABC Clio, and now it's all under Bloomsbury Publishing. Wow. And it's a great uh, uh, day. Quite frankly, it's a great day. Why is it so... Uh, oh, am I into this already? Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, let me just say uh, right up front, if... But at any time that you have questions, comments, please do not hesitate to email me at baileye.ecu.edu or ejb678 at gmail.com. That's ejb678 at gmail.com. And hopefully you will want to like and subscribe this podcast show, but all the other podcast shows that I uh, felt compelled to produce and put out there. Because simply, there are not enough discussions and uh, issues raised on a lot of topics, even in 2023 on race and ethnic relations. So, with that said, and uh, hopefully everything is working well in the studio. With that said, again, this is a celebration. Celebration of seven of of my Bloomsbury uh, publishing books. And you probably, now you're asking, what's the... Why should I uh, listen to this? What are the books? Oh, let me give you the books. 
And of course, it's it, this is a way to get the message out there that there's so many of us over the decades who are continually uh, expand the the horizon. It, it continues to push the envelope. And I just want to make sure I yeah that I can see my my uh, <laughs> my screen kind of froze up, but I'm still there. I'm still there. What are the se uh, seven books that are now under uh, Bloomsbury Publishing? And let me just give you Bloomsbury first. Bloomsbury is a uh, very uh, international global publishing uh, company. It has um, offices in in uh, New York. In London, in New Delhi, in Sydney, Australia, uh, and uh, what a, yeah, Sydney, Australia, and so and it's a global, international, publishing agency. So this gets the discussion of race and ethnic relations out there on a global stance, on a global environment and global platform. So I truly, truly, let me just say right off, I truly appreciate uh, Bloomsbury recognizing the content, the issues that I brought up in each and every one of my books over the 25 years. And right, right now, when I started working on these books 25 years ago, so I truly appreciate the uh Continual support of Bloomsbury Publishing. So please go. Let me just say right up. Please go to Bloomsbury.com and check out my books and check out so many other books that are related to race and ethnic relations. And again, it's a global issue. It's an international issue. It has not gone anywhere. And it's so fascinating. Let me just—it's so fascinating to see the types of books, uh, internationally, globally, that are at the top. That uh, that different uh, um, folks in different countries prefer to read. So I hope my books really touch individuals in different countries: in the UK, in India, in uh, in Australia, in in other parts of our world. So what are the books, very quickly, and I'm going to give you, let me just tell you, I'm going to read uh, uh, the um, book, uh, the synopsis of each and every book. But here's the titles of my seven, seven books by Bloomsbury. The first one, as you know, Race and Ethnic Relations on Campus, Understanding, Empowerment, and Solutions for College Students. That was 2018 when I wrote that, published that book in 2018. And that was just a, a, a really a fun book. Uh, and now I use that book, quite frankly, for, for my classes, for my race and ethnic relations class. The next book, The New Face, The New Face of America, How the Emerging Multiracial, Multi-Ethnic Majority is Changing, is Changing the United States. That's my 2013 book, 2013 book. And then I have... The next book, The Cultural Rights Movement, The Cultural Rights Movement, uh, Fulfilling the Promise of Civil Rights for African Americans. And then I have Black America, Body Beautiful, Black America, Body Beautiful. That was my, uh, that was my 2008 book, Black America, Body Beautiful, How the African American Image is Changing the Fashion, Fitness, and Other Industries. And then I have my food choice in obesity in Black America. Food choice, obe food choice in obesity in Black America. Creating a new cultural diet. That was my 2006 book. My 2006 book. And then African American alternative medicine. Using alternative medicine to prevent and control chronic disease. And uh, that was my 2002 book. And then my 2000 book, published in 2000, which I use regularly now in my medical anthropology class, entitled Medical Anthropology and African American Health. Medical Anthropology and African American Health, published in 2000. So you can see, over the past 23 years, 
but actually 25 years when I started researching the very first book. Uh, 23 years of publishing these books. It's been a joy. It's been hard work doing the research, but I felt passionate. Passionate. Motivated. Guided. By just the desire to further ask questions and get my own answers. Let me just say right up front, these books are just my perspective on life. As I ventured into new territory in my fields of anthropology and public health, in my fields of anthropology and public health, and culture, and communities, and particularly the African American population, which I'm proudly, proudly to be a part of, of course. So I had questions as a, you know, really as a young kid, and then would become a professional, I want to investigate these issues. So let me just get to the highlights of these, uh, of these, uh, Bloomsbury Publishing Book. I'm going to read the front, the cover, the, the synopsis of each book. Starting with Race and Ethnic Relations on Campus, Understanding Empowerment and Solutions for College Students, 2018. 2018. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here's the uh, overview. As racial and ethnic incidents continue to occur at college campuses across the nation, an esteemed African-American professor who teaches in the heart of a uh, of a region that has seen some of the most volatile racial incidents in American history, breaks the uneasy silence to respond to growing concerns from undergraduate students. In Race and Ethnic Relations on Campus, Understanding Empowerment and Solutions for College Students, Dr. Eric Bailey presents a new approach to addressing and better understanding the major controversial issues associated with race and ethnic relations for today's college students. This book confronts commonplace race relations issues directly and sets forth a completely different way of addressing these problems that empowers today's college students to take charge and start to affect change, to do something about racially charged conflict rather than to simply talk about it. The chapters describe how race and ethnic relations issues typically arise on college campuses, share insight into how national incidents affect college students' reactions to incidents on their campus, and identify the negative consequences of poor race relations, as well as describe the positive, positive effects of good race relations. There you go. That's the overview of race and ethnic relations on campus. Understanding Empowerment and Solutions for College Students. I love that book. That, that's a book that I use each and every semester for my race and ethnic relations class. And it continues to grow and grow and grow each and every semester. So that's book number one, 2018. Here's the next Bloomsbury book, The New Face of America, How the Emerging Multiracial, Multi-Ethnic uh, Majority is Changing the United States when I published this in 2013. Here we go. The number of Americans who identified themselves as belonging to more than one race has gone up 33% since 2000. But what does it mean to identify oneself as multiracial? How does it impact such basics as race relations, health care, and politics? Equally important, what does this burgeoning population mean for the U.S. businesses and institutions? More and more, the ideal of America as a melting pot is becoming a reality. Written from the perspective of multiracial citizens, the new face of America, how the emerging multiracial, multi-ethnic majority is changing the United States, brings to light the values, beliefs, opinions, and patterns among these populations. It assesses group identity and social recognition by others, and it communicates how multiracial individuals experience America's reaction to their increasing numbers. Comprehensive and far-reaching, 
this thoughtful comp uh, comp comprehensive cover that cov covers the cultural historic cultural history of multiracials in America. It looks at multiracial families today, at interracial relationships, at rural and urban multiracial populations, and at multiracial physical features, health disparities, bone and marrow, marrow transplant issues, adoption matters, as well as multiracial issues in other countries. Multiracial entertainers, athletes, and politicians are considered as well. Among the book's most important topics is multiracial health and healthcare disparity. Disparity. Finally, the book makes clear how America's current majority institutions, organizations, and corporations must change their relationship with multiracial and multi-ethnic populations if they wish to remain viable and competitive. This was a book that I truly enjoyed researching, investigating, and uh, providing the latest information on multiracial. Again, when you are a part of everyday life and you're teaching college students, you see the landscape changing dramatically. And there were there uh, there now it's 2023. When I wrote this book, 2013, seemed like uh, from from my perspective, a lot of folks were not acknowledging the dramatic growth of multiracial America's multi-ethnic uh, uh, communities and I wanted to put a, a, a foundation and celebrate celebrate multiracial Americans even more wow that was in 2013 and that has been a, a groundbreaking book and actually it had a well my family is very multiracial uh, and my family uh, of of uh, uh, from my parents and grandparents and relatives, we're very multiracial, very multi-ethnic. So it was a celebration of my extended family as well. My next book, the next book, Cultural Rights Movement, Fulfilling the Promise for uh, uh, promise of Civil Rights for African American, 2010. Here it is. Here, here's the synopsis. On election night, Barack Obama crystallized his historic election by saying, quote, it's been a long time coming, but change has come to America, unquote. But with that echoing of Sam Cooke's haunting speech came an acknowledgement that a large percentage of African Americans have yet to reap the tangible benefits of the civil rights movement. With an African American in the White House, there is no better time for assessing the progress the United States has made in protecting the rights of all of its citizens. The cultural rights movement, fulfilling the promise of civil rights for African Americans, offers such an assessment with an in-depth look at the Obama administration. Proposed initiatives as they relate to African American community and a survey of civil rights issues that need to be re-examined in light of Obama's election. The cultural rights movement is a well-researched, powerfully written analysis of why a substantial number of blacks have yet to get their piece of the American dream. Coverage includes discriminatory lending practices, unfair congressional redistricting, Disparities in physician care and health care outcomes, the low number of black students, faculty members and coaches in mainstream universities, the phenomenally high rate of blacks being arrested, convicted and incarcerated, the continual growth of black unemployment and poverty and the near the near total neglect of the reparations issue. Wow, that was a fun book to uh, write yet a very my most difficult book to write and research uh, when researching this book I came across a lot of information that I just could not put in this book because it went not just the history of the United States but the politics of what's happening what happened in the United States in 2010 and this was one of my most challenging books to put together i wanted to do i knew i needed needed to do that do this particularly during uh the the election of uh barack obama and 
examining the policies, examining how America would react to these policies, and what's the place for African Americans with all our civil rights history, what was next. So I, I dug deep in this particular book, and I truly, truly uh, was exhausted with this book, but so much of a celebration of what has gone through and what could what could have happened? Let me say that. <laughs> so that was my 2010 book. Okay, next book, next book. Uh, Black American Body Beautiful, How the African American Image is Changing Fashion, Fitness, and Other Industries. Very quickly, very quickly. Despite all the medical and media attention focused on the rate of overweight and obesity in the African American population, African American images and body types are generally influencing changes in fashion, fitness, advertising, television, and movie industries. This is because, quote, overweight, like beauty, can be in the eye of the beholder. Most research studies investigating attitudes about body image and body type among African Americans have shown that they are more satisfied with their bodies than are their white counterparts. Most black women, for example, are of course concerned with how they look, but do not judge themselves in terms of their weight and do not believe they are valued mostly on the basis of their bodies. Black teen girls most often say um, being thick and curvaceous with large hips and ample thighs is seen as most desirable body shape. Thus, there appears to be a wider range of acceptable body shapes and weights and more flexible standard of attractiveness among black Americans as compared to whites. That fact is not lost on the leaders of industries that might profit from understanding the wide range of beauty as well as playing to it. Voluptuous supermodel Tyra Banks is just one African American who's broken the mold in that industry. The effects have been seen right down to the department and local clothing stores where lines of larger and plus size fashions are expanding and becoming more colorful and more ornate. In the fit fitness industry, health gurus uh, Madonna Grimes and Billy Blanks have been revolutionizing how people get fit and how fitness needs to be redeveloped for African American population. Advertising has taken a similar turn, not the least manifestations of which were the major campaigns of Dove and Nike ran in 2005 with plus-size actresses who continued to appear in the promotions for both companies. In movies and on television shows, the African-American beauty body image has followed suit. In this book, medical anthropologist Dr. Eric Bailey introduces and explains the self-acceptance and body image satisfaction of African Americans and traces how that has spurred changes in industry. His book fills the void of scientific evidence to enhance the understanding of African Americans' perception related to body image and beauty. And it is the first to document these issues from the perspective of an African American male. Wow. This was a great book to write because I had to do field work. I, 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 was, I felt the need to write this book because the entire, so many industries, fashion, fitness, and other industries were neglecting by the perspective of body image, body type among African Americans. So I did a lot of research on this. I did a lot of field work research on this, by the way. <laughs> company by sometimes I'm a field work a company uh, with my wife <laughs> doing field work at different fashion shows uh, in the area and uh, so uh, and, to, and actually uh, getting the input from African American women. Obviously, I could not write this uh, perspective, this book, just from my male per, uh, perspective. So I definitely needed to bounce off issues with Mrs. B, my wife. <laughs> and we had a great, I had a great time putting this together and she gave me great feedback all throughout. So again, and I felt the need to do this because, you know, I'm, I was always raised around African-American women all my life. <laughs> From my grandparents 
uh, uh, my grandma, my grand, both grandmothers, my mom, uh, and it's a celebration of African American women uh, because our my family's always had uh, uh, very beautiful uh, women each and every generation. So this is really a celebrate. This was a book celebrating the beauty, the body types, the body image of African American women to the fullest degree. <laughs> Let me just say that. So that was a, a my 2008 book. Next, next. Uh, this uh, matter of fact, this podcast show is going to run a little bit longer. The next book, uh, Food Choice and Obesity in Black America, Creating a New Cultural Diet, my 2006 book. Here's a quick synopsis. Anthropologist Dr. Eric Bailey uses a cultural and holistic analysis of African-American food preferences to show how black Americans generally perceive health, body image, food, dieting, physical fitness, and exercise. As is true of Americans overall, black Americans are becoming more overweight and obese than ever before. So, too, they are seeing the consequences, heart attacks, strokes, hypertension, and type 2 diabetes at earlier and earlier ages. Dr. Bailey offers a new cultural diet for black Americans and a prescription for working collectively, not only to understand this critical health issue, but also to establish a lifestyle strategy that will be both effective and manageable. This book includes celebrity and black Americans who have fought excess weight. Also includes the cultural history of black American cuisine. Also includes a review of soul food cookbooks. Also includes a critique of corporate America's failure to market health and fitness to the black community. And it also includes an overview of federally funded diet and fitness programs for black Americans. Again, I wrote this book. I love this book because it's all about uh, uh, fitness. But I was very concerned, very concerned of um, the unfortunate, serious consequences of not being fit. Consequences such as heart attack, strokes, hypertension, type type 2 diet, all related to uh, food choice and food selections. And that's the reason why I felt I needed for myself, because I was, again, I'm diagnosed with a, uh, um, hypertension myself, uh, borderline hypertensive. And um, and at that time, I was struggling with, uh, you know, keeping my weight down. And so I said, I'm going to dive into this. How do I uh, manage uh, getting older, but also maintaining my health and fitness? And then I realized uh, I needed to uh, really see it from the perspective of so many African Americans, but real, and also develop a new cultural diet. That is uh, uh, accepted. That is understood. That is uh, that appreciates the cultural history, the preferences, the food preferences, the exercise preferences from the African American perspective. There was nothing out there, so that's the reason why I wrote this food choice and obese, and it really exploded. This book really exploded in, uh, in 2006, and I had a great time researching this book, but also creating a cultural diet. That I that I know really worked. So again, truly appreciate uh, this book, Food Choice and Obesity in Black America, Creating a New Cultural Diet. Very timely in 2006 and even much more important now in 2023. The next book, the next book, African American Alternative Medicine, Using Alternative Medicine, Using Alternative Medicine, uh, uh, Using to prevent and control chronic disease. And I'm just going to read the first couple of, uh, in the preface, the preface portion. It doesn't have an overs overall. And I lo- enjoyed this book, 2002. Here we go. African American Alternative Medicine, Using Alternative Medicine to Prevent and C- Control Chronic Disease is another teaching text and resource guide for students, healthcare professionals, healthcare researchers, healthcare policy makers, and the general public that examines the alternative med- medical systems and practices from an African American perspective. And, and, and I said, as, as, I, as I complete my first book with uh, the previous, uh, I realized that I, a unique opportunity to examine another compelling research uh, uh, issue associated with African Americans' alternative medicine. Although I, I had become aware of this issue years earlier, when I was collecting my qualitative and quantitative health data among Detroit African Americans from 1984 to 1987 
in a hypertension health belief study, I was not aware of a significant role in health care seeking, health disparity, and particularly preventive health care maintenance among African Americans. In addition, uh, as I gave presentation talks, discussed the major themes of that book with individuals, groups, reporters, and other experts, I saw the desperate need Desperate need to research alternative medicine in the United States, especially from an African-American perspective. Thus, this book is actually an outgrowth of research issues related to my last book, as well as comments, questions, and inquiries from the public and the general lack of serious public dialogue, public policy, and research agenda for African-American alternative medicine and its potential, its potential in reducing and preventing major chronic diseases in the United States. Therefore, the major goal of this book is to examine African-American alternative medicine, complementary therapies from a clinical and cultural relativistic perspective. So that's the reason why I did this 2002 book. I wanted to dig deeper, deeper into alternative medicine and see the potential connections that it has in prevention and also particularly with the chronic diseases. So again, I dug deep into alternative medicine, looked at and, and the, the issues were just right there after my previous book. So uh, that's where this book still stands. And matter of fact, I gave pre presentation at the National Library of Medicine in 2002 on this, on the highlights of this book. And uh, again, at National uh, Library of Medicine at the National Institute of Health, uh, and uh, really had great um, positive feedback on it. And it, this book really exploded back in 2002, and it's still, still very important in 2023. So now we're at the final book, my seventh book with Bloomsbury. And this is a book that I use regularly, regularly in my uh, undergraduate and graduate class. This book is entitled Medical Anthropology and African American Health, published in 2000, published in 2000. It's a classic book. It's, it's, this is a book that really encompasses a lot of my uh, field work. And uh, let me just give you a quick synopsis of it very quickly. Medical Anthropology African American Health is a teaching text and resource guide for students, healthcare professionals, healthcare researchers, and the general public that explain, explains the relationship of culture to African American healthcare issues. The major emphasis of this book is a cultural relativistic approach to healthcare assessment, intervention, and implementation programs designed especially, especially for African Americans. Cultural relativistic refers to the concept of understanding and evaluating individual and or a group's uh, from his or her or the group's perspective. And then I go into a very uh, uh, an oversight uh, that this book. Uh, I provide an overview of the field of medical anthropology, culture, and ethnic populations. And then I dive deep, deep into African American health care issues, a cultural relativistic perspective, the data, the hard data. And then I have a small uh, a chapter on African American alternative medicine. See, that's where it was. And then how to do medical anth anthropology field work. How to do medical anthropology, the strategies for conducting medical anthropology, the steps. And I provide the steps and I even show myself conducting field work, qualitative field work back in Detroit, Michigan, <laughs> back in other areas. But really the bases in Detroit, Michigan, where I started identifying and categorizing and quantifying my strategies for medical anthropology research. And then I have a section of medical anthropology case studies, my field work. Uh, and my studies in the clinic, in the community, in public health settings. I actually highlight several uh, field work uh, projects. Uh, for example, field work in a cardiopulmonary clinic. That was the clinic that I, I did back in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Also a chapter on psychosocial stress and African-American women. That was a study I did with the Cincinnati Health Department. Field work in the Detroit Hospital. That's a, a field work that I did in Detroit uh, uh, Henry Ford Hospital. A needs assessment of prenatal intervention program. That was a, a study that I did in Houston, Texas. A prenatal program, the baby buddy, um, buddy program in Houston, Texas. Culturally competent health screening program. That 
that was a study that I did in Fort Wayne, Indiana, when I was uh, uh, consulting with the Indiana State Health Department. And then another study, diabet uh, Diabetics Patients Adaptation to the Outpatient Clinic. That's a study that I did with uh, at the IUPY uh, Hospital uh, in Indianapolis uh, uh, in a diabetes clinic. And then HIV AIDS Counseling and African American uh, Community. That was a research study I did in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, uh, actually, following case managers around in, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, and finding out their strategies of keeping HIV patients in the healthcare system. And then another fieldwork project, community perception of the healthcare system, issues of equity. That was more of a one-on-one -on -one assessment of uh, individual African Americans' perceptions of the healthcare system in Indiana, and then I finish with culture and health of uh, the future of African Americans' healthcare research, healthcare strategies. And again, this medical anthropology African American health book is a book that I regularly use in my medical anthropology classes and also my ethnic and rural health disparities classes graduate classes today in 2023. So there you go. There, those are the seven books. From Bloomsbury that I wanted to feature, for, uh, for actually, uh, let me just say, medical anthropology, African American health, African American alternative medicine, using alternative medicine to prevent and control chronic disease, food choice and obesity in Black America, creating a new cultural diet, Black American body beautiful, how the African American image is changing the fashion, fishing, uh, fitness, and other industries. The cultural rights movement fulfilling the promise of civil rights for African Americans. The new face of America. How the emerging multiracial, multi-ethnic majority is changing the United States and race and ethnic relations on campus, understanding empowerment and solutions for college students. There you go. This was a special, special race and ethnic relations podcast show. Show number 76. It's entitled Celebrating Dr. B's Seven Bloomsbury Books. Again, I appreciate you spending the time listening to this special, special podcast show. And I just wanted to present these and, and these types of uh, books that uh, that really sets the ground rule uh, for race and ethnic relations in the past, in the present, and of course, in the future. So I want to thank uh, my podcast uh, podcasting platforms again: Popbean, Popbean, iHeartRadio, uh, uh, Google Play, Google Play, uh, uh, Amazon, Amazon, uh, Audible, Audible, uh, Spotify, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much for showcasing race and ethnic relations podcast show. I am Doctor B. I am Doctor B. Thank you for your time and enjoy twenty twenty three. 2024. We out. Peace out, everyone.